Good morning, Quad Cities. It's so good to be with you this morning. Uh, we've got a great day coming up, got a great show. Uh, we're going to be talking about a few things that are kind of interesting today. We're going to be talking about gut health. And a lot of you people that are interested in health, of course, are vitally interested in this because if you've been, you know, looking at YouTube videos, doctor, uh, following Dr. Mercola, or actually researching any of this stuff at all, you find out that everybody says you've got to start with the gut. So we're going to be talking a little bit about the gut today. Um, we're going to say we love our guts, okay? That's something that we need to do because uh, it's that important. First of all, I want to make a few announcements, though. One of the things that um, uh, our wonderful helper, Angelique, is doing a lot with these days is our uh, Facebook feed. And uh, she's doing a great job of that. In fact, she's taking a lot of the programs here that we do uh, in, on Saturday morning, and she's kind of chopping them up, chopping them up into bite-sized pieces and putting them on our Facebook feed. So, um, you know, if you want some of the the gems of the Saturday morning broadcast, go to Facebook, and you'll see some of those posted. And usually, they're posted during the week, sometime after the show. So, um, if there's a particular one that you, you know, a particular uh, Thing that interested you or that caught your attention or something that you thought you could probably benefit from is most likely going to be on face, Facebook. So, um, you know, look at that. Also, of course, we've got the Tuesday evening seminar for weight loss, which is always a great time. We uh, will do that, you know, whether there's 20 people or one person and uh, because we really are dedicated, we are committed to getting you the help you need when it comes to losing the fat weight. One of the things we do not find acceptable is the loss of muscle. A lot of the weight loss programs out there actually help you lose weight. And of course, muscle is heavier than fat. Fat is kind of fluffy. Uh, muscle is compact. It's kind of the difference between a bucket of water and a bucket of uh, ping pong balls. You know, the fat is a uh, for those of you who are chemistry geeks, covalent compound, you know, not ionically bonded, it's loose, it's fluffy, whereas fat is just like, I mean, muscle is just heavy, it's water-laden, it's compact. So if you want to lose weight, you can lose muscle, but that's the unhealthy way to lose the weight. With the ideal protein protocol that we feature at our clinic, the thing you lose is the fat, and that's what you want to lose. Okay, now, of course, by the way, I have to caution you about this. You've got to overcome lots of the, um, what we call, well, they're ex excuses, but they're, you know, they're deep-based excuses. They're things that have helped you in your survival in the past, but you have to overcome things like, you know, well, people expect me to be the life of the party, and to be the life of the party, I've got to eat like crazy, you know, I've got to, I've got to drink, and I've got to eat, and I've got to do all these things to make sure that nobody thinks that I am in the least bit inhibited. Yeah, but um, are those people going to be there for you when you, as a matter of fact, say, well, I can't do this anymore because I've got diabetes. I can't do this anymore. I can't, I'm not going to be coming to the party tonight because I'm just sick and my energy is so low that I, I just can't do this. Are those people that you're showing off for in terms of how, you know, I'll, off the chart, you know, great you are and how much fun you are, are those people going to be there when you can't get down on the floor with your grandchildren because huh, you can't get up once you're down there? Are they going to be there for you at that particular point? The answer is a clear no. They will be on the chair not being able to get down for their grandchildren either and not coming to any more parties. <laughs> so, you know, kind of get over these excuses. Always think about the, those things, those things that come up in the back of the mind, the things that, you know, say, well, I'm not ready to do that yet because I, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure you look at the implications of those things, not only just now, but long-term implications, the things that are going to dog you for decades after you reach a certain age or after you reach a certain weight where, you know, even if you do take the weight off at that particular point, it's going to be some real challenging stuff to get back to any kind of normal life. So think about those things when you are thinking about coming to the Welcome to Health Center on Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock, and you say, you know, 
it's going to be a lot more fun. I'm going to be a lot more fun to my friends when I'm 60, 70, even 80, you know, because you'll probably make it to that. When I take care of this health problem now and learn how to make sure that my health is stable now. And I would encourage you to think of those things at this point because this is the right time. And what, what, I mean, when are you going to do it? Whenever you do start the project, it's going to be one of those nows. So get there Tuesday evening, 630, and we will start talking to you about this, start coaching you. Our wonderful coach, Kay, is, uh, I mean, she's just absolutely incredible. We should get her a big T-shirt with coach across it, except the clothes she wears are so beautiful and stylish and everything. I, I, I couldn't stand that. In any case, so anyway, but get there Tuesday evening, 630. Let's take a Okay, we're back, and we're going to be talking about your guts. Well, what about gut health? What are the kinds of things that go wrong with gut health? Well, there's a thing that's around, and I'm sure many of you have heard of it, because chances are that many of you have either been diagnosed with it or you've had friends that are diagnosed with it, and that's an acronym called SIBO, S-I-B-O. It stands for Small Intestinal Bacterial Overgrowth. Small Intestine Bacterial Overgrowth. And it's become a serious problem. And the reason that it's a problem is because you're not supposed to have many bacteria in your small intestine. You're supposed to have buckets, loads of bacteria in your large intestine, in your bowel, in the colon. But you're not supposed to have many in your small intestine. Now, there'll be some there, of course. But the thing is that about, oh, I'd say 80% of your immune system is in your intestines. It's in your gut. And most of that actually is in your large intestine. But all the time, your immune system is trying to protect you from any kind of invading organisms. As a matter of fact, it starts right away in your mouth. Your taste, of course, informs you when the meat's gone bad. And uh, all of us have had that experience where we say, oh my gosh, that doesn't taste quite right. I wonder if I should swallow it. And then you swallow it and you find out later you shouldn't have swallowed it, <laughs> right? That's where it starts. And then your tonsils pick up and analyze chemistry. One of the reasons you don't want your tonsils just torn out, you know, indiscriminately, is that because those things take up that masticated food, the food that has been chewed up and, you know, and um, liquefied, et cetera, in your mouth, and it takes that stuff and it analyzes the chemistry. And it says, well, this is what we're going to expect when it gets to the stomach. And the stomach produces acid, which kills most of the bacteria in your food. It kills most of the harmful substances. It breaks the meat and the proteins down into amino acids so they can be used to build new proteins when they're absorbed. It uh, acidifies B vitamins so that they can be absorbed. It acidifies uh, minerals so they can be absorbed, all that stuff. And then it goes into the small intestine. And the small intestine injects bile into it so the fats get broken down and so we don't get overloaded with cholesterol. And, uh, you know, the pancreatic enzymes come in to break down uh, different elements of digestion, and it goes through the small intestine, and the body is very sensitive to whether or not there are any harmful substances there. And the complexity of the warning system is absolutely amazing. And then what happens? Well, any problems that there are coming down the gut, those things are eliminated by all kinds of immune cells the mouth, you know, already has communicated with the immune system to tell what's coming. The, the uh, um, tonsils have communicated with the, the system and the liver and everything to say what kinds of chemistry is coming down. So what needs to be neutralized, what needs to be enhanced, etc. And by the time it's in the small intestine, it's pretty well dealt with. But then it goes through the intestine, goes through the ileocecal valve, which kind of takes the food that is kind of like depleted of nutrients now for the most part, except for fiber and things like that. It goes into the colon, and in the colon, the fiber becomes the food for a wealth of bacteria. In fact, the estimation is that there's about 10 times more DNA or more organisms in the colon than there are in our whole body. And what do those organisms do? Well, they do great things for us if it's the right ecosystem, if it's the right 
microbiome, they do things like they eat the things that we haven't digested that need to be reprocessed. And a lot of our B vitamins, as a matter of fact, are made by those bacteria in our colon. And then they're reabsorbed through the colon. A lot of our um, liquid is reabsorbed in the colon so that when the feces come out, they're not just, you know, it's not always diarrhea. And if you don't have all those bacteria in there, then it can really upset things. Now, are there ways of getting these, this ecosystem in our gut back into shape? The answer is yes. That's one of the things we do a lot of at the Welcome to Health Center. We focus on getting the gut to work well again. Now, a lot of times there's a lot of competition because the, a lot of patients come in and they've cultivated gut problems. And the gut problems are primarily cultivated by medication. Uh, one of the biggest problems with, with medication is neutralizing the stomach acid. Oh my goodness, you know, uh, you've got this, this acid that is there specifically for certain functions. It's there to make sure that things get broken down properly so they can be reabsorbed. And then what, we, what do we do? We neutralize the stomach acid and those bad things come through unaffected. Not good. That kind of thing can be very damaging to health because it can lead to malnutrition, frankly. It can lead to, um, it can lead to problems with allowing bacteria to come through that aren't supposed to have ever been in the gut whatsoever. One of the biggest problems in uh, the world today is besides SIBO, which of course um, it's obvious how that can happen if as a matter of fact we let the wrong bacteria into the small intestine after it's in the stomach. And when that happens, of course, then that has a way of planting itself and then it starts growing in there. And frankly, to some extent, the more nutrition we give that, the more it grows. Because why? Because bacteria need nutrition too. And a lot of the nutrition we give bacteria is the same nutrition that we need. But then we do other things. We, 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 when we neutralize the stomach acid, and what's, what are the ways we neutralize the stomach acid? Well, you know, the traditional, back when I was a kid, it was Tums. And that just plain neutralized it right in the stomach. But then we got more sophisticated medications that actually prevent the stomach from making stomach acid. And this is even worse because now instead of just taking the Tums when we need to neutralize the stomach acid to get comfortable, now it never functions properly. Whether we have acid reflux or whether we have heartburn or not, it's always reduced. And what does that do? Well, one of the worst things it can do besides the SIBO is it can actually allow deadly bacteria like Clostridium difficile into the gut. Now, Clostridium difficile has the name difficile on it. And in Latin, difficile, and if you speak Spanish, difficile means the same thing, and that's difficult. Why is it called difficult? Because it's very, very difficult to get rid of. Most antibiotics don't even touch it. Most antibiotics will just, as antibiotics do, kill lots of bacteria, but since all the bacteria that are competing in the gut with the Clostridium difficile are now dead, but the Clostridium difficile has lived through it, now it even has more real estate and it starts taking up more of the gut. And so by actually killing the bacteria in the gut, you help the Clostridium difficile. And it is absolutely awful. I mean, you talk about having problems now, you ain't seen problems until you start having problems with that. And it can actually be deadly. So, you know, you don't want that, obviously. But how do we get ourselves in these problems? We actually start taking medication for a temporary problem. And some of the times it's just a lifestyle problem. I mean, again, you know, as we, when we were talking about the, the um, uh, Tuesday evening seminar for weight, you know, you're at a party and you just want to show off at how manly you are or how fun a party you are and you're going to do all this stuff that's just ridiculously stupid, but you don't care because, well, you might have had a little too much to drink and you're just, you know, doing this to, to you know, be part of the, the life of the party, so to speak. And so you eat too much, drink too much, you eat too late, and now you're going to bed with a with a belly that's sticking out because of all you've eaten, and you expect that to be a good outcome? I don't think so. 
because you now can't produce enough acid to digest all that food, even if you didn't take the proton pump inhibitors, even if you didn't take the acid um, reflux medications. And now, basically, you're letting food into your intestines that is undigested, full of bacteria that you are not defending yourself against well. And the whole process just is amplified or it gets started and you're, you know, in a bad way. So what we're encouraging you to do, of course, is don't do that, number one. Um, demonstrate instead how proud you are that you're a person of strength who is concerned with your health rather than a person who is, what would you say, more concerned with their party image than their health. Seems to me that in the end, people will admire you more for your strength of character in making sure you're healthy than in making sure that you're like thought of as a crazy person. <laughs> well, when you're young, that's an important value, right? <laughs> Maybe. But as we get a little older, the crazy person value just kind of like fades into the background and you'd rather be healthy because it's a whole lot more comfortable on those off party moments when there's nobody around to show off for. In any case, so gut, let's take a break and hear from one of our sponsors and then we're gonna get into some solutions and, and uh, understanding it a little bit better. You know, we're talking about gut health and we're talking about the effect of gut health on generalized health. And it's very, very important. It's probably the central issue in nutrition these days. Because if your gut's not healthy, then you probably have malnutrition. And, you know, you've seen these little um, these clips from, from Africa and things like that where the little children have the protuberous belly. And, and that's usually a protein deficiency. And it's uh, a horrible thing. These children have a very difficult time. Uh, with their health because of this and when they start that way. But if you look around the United States today and look at the number of people who have a protuberous belly, you have to wonder, is that just from eating way too much? And it often is. But it could also be a protein deficiency. And how could that happen? Well, you have to ask the people whether they are taking the proton pump inhibitors, the acid-reducing medications that were originally for, um, you know, uh, the heartburn and things that they were experiencing, but it's become something that is chronic. Namely, they're taking a medication that you're only supposed to be on maximally for two weeks, and they've been on it for years. And you have to wonder how much of that protuberous belly is actually a protein deficiency because they just aren't getting the, the digestion of the proteins and having the breakdown of proteins that they need. Also, of course, there's, there's a, another factor too. How many times do you know people or you have been on antibiotics in the last five years? It doesn't take very often, but what happens is then what you do is you destroy the bacteria. Remember we said there are 10 times more bacteria in your colon than, um, it, uh, than cells in your entire body. And the truth of that is that the bacteria are helping you. They are there in order to balance things, in order to make sure that you uh, are getting the proper nutrition. They depend on you and you depend on them, but the antibiotics can take them out. And one of the most powerful antibiotics that does that is an antibiotic that is hidden, and that is an antibiotic called glyphosate. Now, many of you will hear that word and you'll immediately know since it's been thrown around a lot. It's the uh, what, uh, Roundup that Monsanto has been you know, selling for um, decades now and saying is harmless. And they say it's harmless and they, their scientific justification for this is that it's harmless because it attacks a pathway in plants that human beings don't possess. That pathway is called the Shixinate pathway and Plants have that pathway, and they found a way of genetically modifying plants so that the, um, the plants that have the genetic modification don't die when you spray them with Roundup, but all the other plants do because you interrupt that pathway, and it kills things. It kills the things that depend on it, all right? Now, that's interesting. I mean, that's amazing. It's scientifically, uh, wow, that's incredible. But the problem is this that 
when you spray that stuff on plants and you eat those plants, you aren't affected by it as a human being, but your microbiome, your gut bacteria, all have the shixinate pathway. And so when you eat food that has been sprayed with Roundup, then, and the Roundup residue is there, and the Roundup residue is in our water and everything else now because it's, it's so ubiquitous, it's everywhere. When you eat that food, those bacteria die. And that's a horrible thing. What's more, all the wheat and grain you eat in this country, virtually all except for organically uh, grown wheat and grain, is sprayed with Roundup a week before it's harvested because they want it to all die uniformly so they can go in with no green spots in the field and they can harvest it uniformly with no problem. So all that Roundup is on your bread when you're eating it. All wheat products, all your cereal, um, Cheerios, everything, it's all sprayed with Roundup a week before you eat it, before you har they harvest it. And as a consequence, those bacteria, those friendly bacteria that are there for your good are dying because of this antibiotic called Roundup. This is amazing because we don't have much time to talk about this, but we don't have any time to talk about it now, but we will talk about it in the future. It can affect you emotionally. Call the Welcome to Health Center. We actually work with this type of thing and provide solutions for all of these problems. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>